Good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to address the Cybos conference today, even if only in virtual form. And my remarks today will be published on the Bank of England website. So if you miss something or have to go off and make a cup of tea, you can catch up on it later. I want to talk today about whether the world of crypto finance poses risk to financial stability. Crypto assets have grown by roughly 200 uh, percent so far this year, from just under $800 billion uh, to $2.3 trillion today. They have grown from just $16 billion five years ago. $2.3 trillion, of course, needs to be seen in the context of the $250 trillion global financial system. But as the financial crisis showed us, you don't have to account for a large proportion of the financial sector to trigger financial stability problems. Subprime was valued at around $1.2 trillion in 2008. When something in the financial system is growing very fast and growing in largely unregulated space, financial stability authorities have to sit up and take notice. They have to think very carefully about what could happen and whether they or other regulatory authorities need to act. At the same time, we do need to be careful not to overreact, particularly when faced with the unfamiliar. We should not classify new approaches as dangerous simply because they're different. Innovation, technology and new players can tackle long-standing frictions and inefficiencies and reduce barriers to entry. Throughout history, they have been key to driving improvement and to increasing resilience in financial services. I'll give you my conclusions at the outset. Crypto technologies offer the prospect of radical improvements in financial services. However, while the financial stability risks are still limited, the current application of crypto technologies to finance are now a financial stability concern for a number of reasons. Crypto assets are growing fast and there is rapid development of new applications for the technology. The bulk of these assets have no intrinsic value and are vulnerable to major price corrections. The crypto world is now beginning to connect to the traditional financial system, and we are seeing the emergence of leverage players. And crucially, this is happening in largely unregulated space. Financial stability risks currently are, as I've said, relatively limited, but they could grow very rapidly if, as I expect, this area continues to develop and to expand apace. How large those risks could grow will depend in no small part on the nature and on the speed of response by regulatory and supervisory authorities. I'll explain today what lies behind these conclusions and what they might imply. First, however, need to explore a little what lies behind the crypto label in the financial system. Crypto itself is the underlying technology, the application of cryptographic innovation to the recording and to the transfer of the ownership of assets, often on public networks open to all. Recording and transferring ownership of assets is the bedrock of the financial system's role in storing value and in making transactions. Crypto technology enables, though it doesn't require, recording and transfer to take place without the banks or the custodians that have historically carried out this function as intermediaries. Within finance, the crypto label covers a multitude of different innovations in financial assets, markets and services. From a financial stability and from a regulatory perspective, what matters is not the underlying technology, but how it's used and the purpose for which it is used. In other words, we should not regulate technologies, but rather the activities that the technology is performing. And in doing so, we need to ensure a consistent approach to risks, regardless of the technology used. I'm not going to attempt the detailed taxonomy of all the crypto innovations in the financial sector. In all probability, a few will have been added by the time I have finished speaking. But in order to discuss the most prominent risks, it's worth breaking them down into unbacked crypto assets used primarily as speculative investments and backed crypto assets intended for use as a means of payment. I'll also touch briefly on the recent developments of decentralized crypto platforms and markets so-called DeFi, that are beginning to offer a broad range of financial services. Unbacked crypto assets make up nearly 95% of that $2.3 trillion total. They are essentially non-replicable strings of computer code 
that can be owned and transferred without intermediaries. Bitcoin, of course, is the most prominent example, but there are now nearly 8,000 unbacked crypto assets in existence. They have no intrinsic value. That is to say, there are no assets, no cash flows or commodities behind them. The value of the crypto asset is determined solely by the price a buyer is prepared to pay at any given moment. As a result, of course, their value is highly volatile. Bitcoin's price movements have, for example, been 12 times more pronounced than those of the S&P 500. For this reason, the main use of unbacked crypto assets is for speculative investment. Some like Bitcoin also have limited issuance and therefore claim to be a hedge against inflation. Although originally mooted as a means of payment, the volatility of their value makes unbacked crypto assets generally unsuitable for making payments, except of course, for criminal purposes. Attitudes to unbacked crypto assets, however, do appear to be shifting. In the UK, fewer holders now say they see them as a gamble and more see them as an alternative or a complement to mainstream investment. Around half of existing holders say they will invest more. And while retail investment predominates in this market, there are signs of growing institutional interest, with institutional investors now thinking about whether to have crypto in their portfolio. More complex investment strategies are beginning to emerge, including crypto futures and other derivatives. At the same time, core wholesale finance and financial market infrastructure firms are putting their toes in the water. Several global banks are offering or are planning to offer digital asset custody services. Some international banks have started to uh, look at trading crypto asset futures and non-deliverable forwards and offering wealth management clients crypto asset investments. Others have developed exchange platforms facilitating match trade or offer customers access to other crypto exchanges through their apps. Leading payment firms, including the card companies, are also exploring ways of allowing people and businesses to use certain stablecoins for payments and for the settlement of transactions within their networks. There are well-founded concerns around unbacked crypto assets in relation to investor protection, market integrity, and financial crime. I'll return briefly to these later, as they can have financial stability implications, although they are not usually the concern of financial stability authorities. A more direct issue from a financial stability perspective, given the unbacked and volatile nature of these assets, is the implications of a major price correction. Such major corrections have been relatively frequent in the short life of unbacked crypto assets. The price of Bitcoin has fallen by over 10% in a single day on nearly 30 occasions in the past five years, with the largest of these a fall of nearly 40% following a cyber incident at a prominent exchange coming in March, March last year. The forward-looking financial stability question is what could result from such events if crypto assets continue to grow at scale, if they continue to become more integrated into the tr traditional financial sector and if investment strategies continue to become more complex. In thinking about this, we should be clear that investors losing money on speculative investments does not in and of itself constitute a financial stability problem, though it may well be a concern for authorities responsible for investor protection. It is a necessary feature of the financial system that investors who understand the risks of speculative investments can make losses, including large ones, as well as gains. The responsibility of the Financial Stability Authority is to ensure that the system is resilient so that those price corrections and consequent losses can occur without knock-on effects on the financial system as a whole and without damage to the real economy. A comparison of two major price corrections from recent history illustrates the point. In the dot-com crash of the early 2000s, investors lost over $5 trillion following a sharp correction in equities, with the technology-focused Nasdaq losing over 75% of its value. In the months before the crash, the index had a market capitalization of roughly $3.5 trillion, and this followed five years of exuberant growth, averaging 42% each year. In this instance, the losses for investors were material, but there was no loss of financial stability. By contrast, the collapse of the $1.2 trillion market in subprime mortgage-backed securities in 2008 
triggered the great financial crisis. In that case, the knock-on effect of a price collapse in a relatively small market was amplified and reverberated through an unresilient financial system, causing huge and persistent economic damage. Whether a major price correction is absorbed by the system, admittedly leaving some investors with very sore heads, or whether it's amplified into a systemic impact, depends on a number of key characteristics of how the asset is integrated into the financial system, especially interconnectedness and leverage. It depends also on the resilience of the system at the time of the correction, the liquidity in the financial system under stress, and the ability of core elements of the system to absorb rather than amplify losses. So a necessary thought experiment from a financial stability perspective is what would happen in the financial system if there was a massive collapse in the price of unbacked crypto assets at the extreme end if the price fell to zero. Such a collapse is certainly a plausible scenario given the lack of intrinsic value, the price volatility, the probability of contagion between crypto assets, the cyber and operational vulnerabilities, and of course the power of herd behavior. Indeed, the stress test scenarios to which we and other authorities subject the banking system are, if anything, much further into the tail of the probability distribution. In such a price correction scenario, the first question that arises is the degree of interconnectedness between crypto and the conventional financial sector. The simplest forms of connections are direct exposures by people or institutions holding crypto assets for speculative purposes. As a large proportion of this activity is still being carried out outside the traditional financial sector, regulators have a limited line of sight into who is holding these assets. It's clear, however, that there are a very large number of retail investors in this space. Financial Conduct Authority research estimates 2.3 million adults own crypto assets in the UK alone. However, the possible losses to retail investors, while raising, as I have said, investor protection concerns, is currently unlikely by itself to be large enough to be a financial stability risk. The picture is less clear for financial institutions. It's useful to distinguish between institutional investors and banks. A recent report identified 150 to 250 specialist crypto hedge funds. The investors behind these funds are typically high net worth individuals and family offices. In many respects, this is a similar story to that of retail investors, though I would expect more appetite to take leverage positions in these sectors. I'd note in passing that the recent Alkagos episode is an illustration of the damage that can be done to banks' balance sheets by speculative and non-transparent investment fund leverage. There is also evidence of a significant and growing interest from more traditional hedge funds, though the data are very limited. In one recent survey of hedge funds, 21% of respondents currently indicated that they were investing in digital assets, and digital assets averaged around 3% of their assets under management. Banks, on the other hand, have, as yet, much more limited direct exposure to crypto, with their activities consisting mainly of agency services. However, there's clearly a prospect for the degree of interconnectedness to rise in the near future. We're starting to see proposals, not just for agency services like custody and trading platforms, but also for balance sheet exposure, including offering broker-dealer services. In response to these developments, the Basel Committee on Banking Standards is consulting on the capital treatment for crypto assets held on banks' balance sheets. Banking industry bodies, however, have in turn been explicit in their view that the currently limited exposure of banks to crypto assets is neither desirable nor sustainable. Direct exposures provide, as I've said, an immediate channel by which losses could be transmitted from crypto assets to the existing financial sector. However, there are also potential second round or indirect effects which can spread the impact into other asset classes. For example, a severe fall in the value of crypto assets could trigger margin calls on crypto positions, forcing leveraged investors to find cash to meet them, leading to the sale of other assets and generating spillovers into other markets. We saw last year during the dash for cash that this dynamic can put pressure on the amount of liquidity in the system. Similarly, there is the risk of contagion. A large fall in crypto valuations could affect investor risk sentiment more broadly, 
causing investors to sell other assets that are judged to be risky or those perceived to have a similar investor base. Interconnectedness creates the possibility that shocks are transmitted through the financial system. However, to gauge the possible impact of a price correction shock, we also need to look at the degree of leverage given its amplification effect. We know that the possibility exists today for both retail investors and institutions to take leverage positions, including through unregulated as well as regulated derivatives infrastructure, and that includes leverage of up to 100 times. At present, it doesn't appear that such services are very widely used. Our best estimate of the derivatives market that offers leveraged exposure to crypto assets is that it totals around $40 billion. On the other hand, and similarly to the story for interconnectedness, there is evidence of rapid growth. To take one example, CME crypto futures trading volume has increased tenfold over this year to around $2 billion a day. And all of this needs to be seen in the context of the lack of transparency that makes assessment of the risk more difficult and of some of the broader issues around crypto assets and the platforms on which they trade. I mentioned the justifiable and growing concerns around investor protection, law enforcement and market integrity. These concerns and the need for regulation to address them have increasingly been highlighted in particular by securities regulators. I will not set them out here. But risks in these areas are not normally the direct responsibility of financial stability authorities because they do not normally pose risks to, to the financial system as a whole. But they can be a trigger for destabilizing market corrections. And as has been observed by the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England, at sufficient scale, they can lead to a damaging and a general loss of confidence in the financial system. Taken together, the volatility of unbacked and largely unregulated crypto assets, their nascent but fast growing integration into the financial sector and the appearance on the scene of leveraged players. My conclusion is that while a severe price correction would not cause financial stability problems now, all else equal, the current trajectory implies that this may not be the case for very long. I noted earlier that the price volatility of unbacked crypto assets makes them unsuitable for use as a settlement asset in payment systems. In order to facilitate payments in crypto assets, a number of crypto asset schemes have emerged that are denominated in fiat money and backed with a pool of assets. The asset pool is intended to stabilize the value of the crypto asset or the coin relative to the fiat peg, hence the name stablecoins. Stablecoins constitute a relatively small proportion of crypto assets. At $130 million, they make up just over 5% of all crypto assets, though they've more than doubled since 2020, when they represented only around 2% of the total. Their use in crypto payment systems has so far been mainly for payments in crypto markets themselves, though there are some signs that they are just beginning to be used by wholesale financial market players and large corporations for, for more straightforward transactions. There are, however, in prospect, a number of proposals, including from big tech platforms, to expand existing stablecoin schemes or to develop new ones as payment systems for use at scale by the general public. From a financial stability perspective, this poses rather different questions to those posed by unbacked crypto assets used for speculative investments. Large scale retail payment systems capable of performing millions of transactions in an instant are a key part of the core infrastructure of the financial system. Households and businesses depend upon them, increasingly so given the trend away from physical cash in many advanced economies. Disruption to their continuous and effective operation or loss of confidence in them can jeopardize financial stability and cause major economic damage. Technological advances and innovation have been welcome and powerful drivers of improvement in the speed, efficiency and functionality of the way we transact, not just in recent decades, but throughout history. Crypto technology offers the prospect of further transformation in the way we pay and in the use of money as a means of transaction. However, the development of stable coins for general purpose use at scale cannot be allowed to come at the cost of lower standards or higher risk to financial stability. Regulatory authorities will need to ensure 
that the standards that apply to current systemic payment systems apply equally effectively to any systemic or likely to be systemic payment system using stable coins. However, applying this principle of same risk, same regulation to systemic payment schemes based on stable coins and crypto technology poses a number of challenges. Unlike existing payment systems, which operate in central bank or commercial bank money, stablecoin schemes issue their own money, the coin. And this raises fundamental issues around the safety and interoperability of private money used in our economies. Stablecoin schemes can be decentralized on public networks with no overarching entity responsible for their operation. They can be structured in novel ways as sets of separately operated yet interdependent functions that can frustrate comprehensive end-to-end -end risk management. A major step towards ensuring the consistent application of international standards to crypto-based financial services was the publication by CPMI IOSCO last week of a report for consultation on how the international standards for systemic payment systems, the principles for financial market infrastructures, the PFMI, should apply to stablecoin schemes. The report confirms that the international standards do apply to systemic or likely to be systemic stablecoin payment schemes. Crucially, it provides guidance on how the standards apply to some of the novel features of stablecoin schemes that distinguish them from existing payment systems. I'll briefly describe a few of the most important elements. As I've noted, a particular challenge of stablecoin schemes is that they can be organized to separate out the functions of creating the settlement asset, of transferring it between buyers and sellers, and of storing it. The guidance makes clear that even if these functions are carried out by separate entities, the standards apply to the scheme as a whole, and the entity carrying out the transfer function is responsible for managing the risk to its safe operation from the other functions in the scheme. The guidance also clarifies the high standards the coin must meet if it, if it is to settle payments. Existing payment systems are required to use the highest quality money, central bank or commercial bank money with minimal liquidity or credit risk as the settlement asset. In other words, they transfer high quality liquid claims on the central bank or on commercial banks between the buyer and the seller. Central bank money, effectively a claim on the state, is the safest, highest quality money in modern advanced economies. For this reason, the PFMI's call for systemic payment systems and other financial market infrastructure to settle in central bank money where possible. Where central bank money is unavailable, systemic payment systems may use commercial bank money instead. The liquidity and credit worthiness of commercial bank money is underpinned by the extensive regulation of banks, by central banks' lender of last resort function, and by deposit guarantee schemes. This means that the money issued by a commercial bank in the form of deposit accounts can be exchanged on demand and at par value for central bank or other commercial bank money whenever the holder desires. Stablecoin payment systems issue and use their own money, the coin, as the settlement asset between buyers and sellers. The guidance sets out that the assets backing the stable coin should enable the coin to observe the same high standards of credit worthiness and liquidity that apply to the money used in existing systemic payment systems. This is crucial to ensure that confidence in the coin can be maintained in normal times and in stress. To this end, the guidance also covers users' claims on the coin scheme and their right to redeem in central bank or in commercial bank money at par, at least by the end of the day. An important element of the guidance covers governance and makes clear that a stablecoin scheme needs to be governed by a discrete legal entity with accountability for the operation of the scheme and for the management of risk. A decentralized crypto algorithm on the internet would clearly fail this requirement. I'll return to this point briefly in the next section on decentralized finance. The guidance now out for consultation clarifies that the international standards for payment systems apply to stablecoin schemes. It'll provide the foundation for regulation to bring systemic stablecoins within the regulatory perimeter. It will remain, of course, a decision for individual jurisdictions whether, and if so, how, under what regulation, to permit the operation of systemic or likely to be systemic stablecoin schemes. But if implemented by jurisdictions, the guidance will provide the baseline. 
and it will, in my view, be likely to lead to changes in the structure of some existing stablecoin schemes, including changes with regard to the asset pool and loss absorbing capital, and also with regard to the responsibilities of scheme operators. The guidance should play an important role in enabling current and prospective stablecoin initiatives to design and structure their schemes to come within international standards. The standards do not address all of the potential financial stability risks from stablecoins used for payments at systemic scale. There is also the possible impact on the banking system. If households and firms shift to holding and using stablecoins for transactions, rather than holding and using commercial bank money in bank deposit accounts, there could in some scenarios be a material shift of deposits out of the banking system. A number of central banks have modelled and estimated the scale and nature of very similar possible impacts on the banking system from the introduction of a central bank digital currency or CBDC. Future demand from households and firms for stable coins and the scale of any constant substitution away from bank deposits is impossible to predict with great certainty. But a series of assessments have fairly consistently reached the conclusion that with careful design and implementation, the steady state impacts of substitution from bank deposits will probably be limited, although there could be greater risks in the transition. It is not to be clear the responsibility of financial stability authorities to preserve any particular business models, including in banking. The banking system has, throughout its history, adapted to technological innovation and competition from new players, and it will need to continue to do so. Indeed, banks have benefited in recent decades from the technological innovations that have driven transactions away from cash to the electronic transfer of bank deposits. However, financial stability authorities do have a legitimate interest in ensuring any transition is smooth and does not generate instability. Finally, I'd like to comment briefly on a more recent set of applications to finance of crypto technology on public networks the rapid growth of decentralized finance, or DeFi, as it's been called. DeFi is a development that demonstrates the increasing complexity and the potential, potentially growing risk in the crypto ecosystem. The label refers to decentralized algorithm-based financial services that rely on smart contracts and that are delivered over DLT platforms without intermediaries. The most prominent use for DeFi at present is the provision of credit. Lending currently represents half of the DeFi market. However, the DeFi model and the technology can be deployed to replicate a range of financial services such as savings, trading, insurance and derivatives. DeFi is very small at present, but growing very fast, from less than 10 billion at the start of 2020 to nearly 100 million uh, last month. The decentralized and global structure of the DeFi sector, along with the difficulty of tracing end users provides a unique set of challenges for regulators. Even on an initial view, it is clear that the sector is opaque, complex and undertakes financial activities that carry risks, activities that are regulated within the traditional finance sector. There are pronounced market integrity challenges given the absence of investor protection, AML and other market integrity provisions. Moreover, even were such regulatory provisions in place, there may be no one for the regulators to engage uh, with and to hold accountable. In practice, the degree of decentralization currently varies across platforms, but uh, uh, in an extreme form, a DeFi platform could be completely decentralized with no identical legal entity, ownership, or even a point of human contact. DeFi is still in its very early infancy, but its rapid growth means that regulators domestically and internationally need to think seriously now about the risks of a broad range of financial services being affected through DeFi platforms and how to ensure that risks are managed in the DeFi world to the same standards that they are managed in traditional finance. At the Bank of England, we've begun some work to this effect. At the beginning of this talk, I, I set up my conclusion that while financial stability risks from the application of crypto technologies are currently limited, there are a number of very good reasons to think that, all else equal, this might not be the case for very much longer. All else is not, of course, equal. Although crypto finance operates in novel ways, well-designed standards and regulation could, and in my view should, 
enable risk to be managed in the crypto world as they are managed in the world of traditional finance. Indeed, bringing the crypto world effectively within the regulatory perimeter will help ensure that the potentially very large benefits of the application of this technology to finance can flourish in a sustainable and safe way. As the chairman of the SEC has observed, financial innovations throughout history do not flourish outside public policy frameworks. Developing the standards and the regulation that give effect to those public policy frameworks is and should be a painstaking and a careful process. But I cannot help observing that in the two years it has taken to develop the draft CPMI IOSCO guidance I referred to earlier, stablecoins have grown 16 fold, although admittedly only to a relatively small amount. Regulators internationally and in many jurisdictions have begun the work of putting the necessary frameworks in place, but it needs to be pursued as a matter of urgency. Technology and innovation have driven improvement in finance throughout history. Crypto technology offers great opportunity. As Emerson said, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. But it has to be a truly better mousetrap and not one that simply operates to lower standards or to no standards at all. Thank you. 